I don't remember the first time I stuttered. Um, it was around, probably around this age, um, I was told that I began stuttering around the age of three years old, which is me then, and I know, I'm adorable. <laughs> However, I do remember the first time that I knew that stuttering was a bad thing. So I was um, around nine, and I was in the Christmas program at my church. My mom is a God-fearing woman, and I was going to go to church every Sunday. I was gonna be in the youth groups, and I went to Catholic school. I had church every day of my life, and when Christmas time comes around, you join the Christmas program because that's what you do as Christians. And so um, I was really excited at our first rehearsal uh, and everybody was given uh, a poem that, you know, like they had to recite in front of the church. So the, the little kids who were four and five are given these very, you know, like short four line poems. Uh, seven year olds are given, you know, like eight line poems. And then, like me, I was given like a 15, 16, you know, like line poem. And so I got my poem and I was so excited. I showed my mom, I'm like, look, like I get to say this in front of the entire church. And so I uh, took it home and I learned every single word and I was really pumped. And so the day before you know, our big program, I got my hair done, I got you know, like a brand new dress, and then um, I went to the rehearsal, you know, like, for the program. And so the four-year-olds went and they were you know, like adorable. And then the five-year-olds went and again, completely adorable. Six-year-olds, a little less adorable. <laughs> then the seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and then it was our turn. And so then, you know, like I watched as, you know, everybody who was you know, like in, in my, you know, age group decided their poem. And then it was my turn. And so I hit up on stage and again, I'm really excited and I open my mouth to speak and the words don't come out as easily as they did for everybody else. And so a poem that should have taken me no more than 45 seconds actually took me around 10-ish minutes to get out. And so I was like, yeah, you know, like that's just me and that's okay. So after I was done, I was kind of pulled to the side, you know, by the um, program organizer and she said, hey, you know, I think that it's probably like a better idea to give you, you know, a poem that's gonna be more aligned like with your s s skills. And so she gave me a poem that was four lines long. And I was a little bit upset. However, I completely understood. I mean, it took me way long to recite a poem and like this whole program isn't about me. So, you know, after it's all over, I get back in the car and my mom was like, hey, so, so hit a go okay? And I said, yeah, um, I had to get a new poem. And I sh showed it to her, and she got so angry. Like, how dare they give you this poem? Like, that's for these little kids. And 
At the time, I was really surprised that she was so upset. And then it dawned on me, oh, I am older. I'm supposed to have a poem like everybody else who's my age. However, I get this little poem that a little kid is supposed to do. And then I felt really embarrassed. I felt really ashamed. And that's when I learned stuttering is a really bad thing. And then, you know, of course, being you know, like a kid, it's like, well, if stuttering is bad and I am a person who stutters, then I must be a bad person. And I took that shame with me for my entire life. Um, you know, as a person who stutters, you kind of, you know, have these things that you feel like you can't do. And so, you know, every day at school, I would have this massive anxiety about, you know, having to read because it was terrifying. Everybody could see the words on the page and I couldn't, you know, avoid not saying any of these words and everybody would know that, yep, I'm weird because I can't talk like other people talk. However, you know, I felt, you know, all of this shame and I kind of put it on stuttering. However, you know, I chose to have this shame. I chose to feel this really, you know, uh, uncomfortable and, and, and insecure around how I communicated. And so I took this with me for my entire life, all through grade school, all through high school, all through college, all through my 20s. I had just this very horrible feeling around communication, around talking. I became so afraid to talk to people that I would just avoid any situations where I had to meet a new person because I was so terrified to even just say my name. And so, you know, I had finally come to this point in my life where I knew that, you know, I had to overcome this fear because everything in my life was suffering as a result of this one small part of me. And so I decided to pursue uh, speech therapy. And so I go to my therapist and I'm really excited because I feel like this is the first day of the rest of my life. And I know that that sounds so cliche, but I walked in there like she's gonna teach me how to avoid you know, having to stutter forever and this is going to solve all of my problems. And she said, okay, look, you know, I'm going to teach you, you know, some techniques to you know, make stuttering kind of easier. However, in order for these techniques to be effective, you have to be comfortable with stuttering. And I almost laughed in her face. Like how can anybody be comfortable with a thing that makes you feel so insecure and so small. And so, you know, instead of being like, <laughs> bye bitch, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to give this woman a try. And so I went, you know, every week for um, a really long time, around seven months. And things kind of improved. However, things also got a little bit worse because I was actually <laughs> thinking about stuttering a lot more. And then there was a day when everything changed. So um, I had to get my car serviced. I think, you know, like I had to get new brakes or something. And so uh, I went to the car dealership and I, you know, like parked in the little place that you have to park. 
And I got out of the car and I went and talked to, you know, one of the service guys and he said, hey, how can I help you? And I opened my mouth to sort of, you know, explain the thing that I need and I was having such a terrible speaking day that it took me a really long time to explain exactly the problem I was having. And in the beginning, he was kind of like, <laughs> okay, this is weird. And then he began to feel sorry for me. And I could see it on his face. And I was so embarrassed. Again, I felt so ashamed and so small. And after what felt like, you know, years and years, I was finally able to, you know, like explain the problem I was having with my car. And he said, okay, cool, you know, like there's a waiting room, you know, over there. Uh, just go, you know, sit there and we'll, you know, come and talk to you, you know, after we've uh, looked at everything. And so, you know, I go into the waiting room and I see that there's a bathroom, you know, over like in the back. And so I go into the bathroom, I go into the very last stall, I close the door and I began to cry. And I didn't cry because of stuttering. I cried because of how stuttering had taken over every aspect of my being. I was avoiding situations where I had to talk. And any time where I did have to talk and I knew I was going to stutter, I was filled with anxiety. And, you know, like it dawned on me, like, I'm not ashamed of stuttering. I'm ashamed of how I feel every time I open my mouth. And so I remember I called my speech therapist and I said, I actually understand now. Like, I don't care if I stutter on every single word every day for the rest of my life. I just need to not feel like this anymore. I need to feel comfortable, right? In the beginning, I was ready to change. However, I didn't, you know, like have to be prepared to change. I had to be prepared for the changes I was trying to make. And so, you know, after I had this conversation with her, I said, okay, so like how can I, you know, like get comfortable talking? And she said, well, how about you pursue public speaking? And I said, no, absolutely not. You're completely insane. Why do I pay you? No. And so, of course, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, at this point, like, this is the lowest point of my life. Let's do something that puts me in front of people that everybody can see my low. <laughs> why not? And so the first talk I gave was about stuttering. I spoke at a university to a fluency seminar, you know, like graduate students. And, and, and the craziest thing happened. Like, I, 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 I didn't die. <laughs> like, I didn't melt into this little lump of embarrassed person. Like, they actually heard everything that I was, you know, like, trying to say, and they enjoyed hearing me speak. And that was the craziest concept. Like, oh, I can talk, I can stutter, and people will actually hear me and not how I'm saying it, but the thing that I'm trying to say. And so, you know, I decided to, you know, like up the ante some. And so I gave uh, something called an Ignite Talk. And I don't know if these are still happening, but they're five minutes. You get 
20 slides, I think, and they change every like 15 seconds. And so I decided, like, hey, like, I'm gonna try this. Now, a person who stutters, who is on a timed thing where the slides change every 15 seconds, that's actually, like, I wouldn't do that now because that's <laughs> actually insane. But this is me giving my Ignite talk. And as you can tell, this is the first talk I've given because I'm using a pie chart to show 1%. <laughs> Super advanced speaking 101. And so, you know, I gave this talk and I was really terrified. I knew that people were just going to be like, why are you on the stage? You know, like it was a room full of people who just did not know me. And I got on stage and really was the only person there who kind of gave them that experience. And after I got off the stage, I got such an overwhelmingly positive response. And it wasn't because of the talk itself, it was because of how the talk made people feel, right? I was willing to be, you know, very insecure, to be incredibly vulnerable, and people really resonated if that, like, hey, like if this person can get up on stage and do this kind of thing, then I can do absolutely anything. And so like this was the first time that I realized that vulnerability is actually the gateway to <laughs> all kinds of things. So after this talk is when um, I was actually offered to come to speak at another tech conference. And I was, again, completely amazed that anybody cared enough about the things that I had to say to be like, hey, I have a conference, so like, you should come and speak at it. What? Cool, why not? So I'm the kind of person who says yes first, and afterwards I have a panic attack about it. <laughs> but the cool thing about it is that because I was vulnerable, I was able to you know, completely change the course of my life. And so vulnerability is the gateway to all kinds of opportunities. So, you know, I'm here to talk about a couple of different things. I'm here to talk about collaboration. I'm here to talk about communication. I'm here to talk about vulnerability, but all under the umbrella of one really important topic. And that topic is, Empathy. So in order to sort of talk about, you know, like what or, or, you know, how empathy can be very impactful for you professionally, we have to begin with, you know, defining uh, what empathy is. So I go to a lot of conferences every single year. And I've heard a lot of people, you know, like talk about this kind of elusive topic of empathy. And so I hear two sort of distinct definitions. And the first one is the dictionary definition of, you know, the ability to, you know, understand the feelings of another person. Which, you know, yeah, like that sounds about right. But the other definition I hear, and I hear this one a lot more, people get angry when they talk about empathy for some reason, which is uh, fine, no judgment. <laughs> but it's that thing that you have to do in order to not be an asshole in the office. <laughs> which, if I'm being like totally honest, both of these definitions are very accurate. However, I don't feel like either one of these, you know, like actually help you define, you know, like what, you know, it feels like to, you know, be empathetic, right? So I sort of came to this place of, you know, how can I, you know, help people like truly understand what empathy is, 
um, because, you know, it's kind of a weird thing that like, Everybody hits it, but like not everybody really understands it. And then it came to me. I can compare it to another thing that everybody understands, but like nobody can like truly explain. And that thing is love. Oh, damn it. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. Brand new, <laughs> I should probably put this over here. Brand new love is awesome. You feel like you can do anything as a result of being with this person. Their hashtag best person ever, bay all day. You like write ridiculously long text messages. Who has time for this? People who are in love. You do dumb things because you want everyone to know just how much you care about this person and they care about you. And it's adorable and it's wonderful and it's warm and fuzzies. But you know, in the beginning, it's, it's all rainbows and cats and Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. But then eventually, you kind of get to know the person and you guys are together for like a little bit longer and then that brand new love, it kind of turns into just love, love, where you have to deal with this person every day, all the time. And so when in the beginning, they were the most perfect person ever, Eventually, it's not so great. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you have to choose this person every day. You know, love as a noun is an idea. It's the best idea. It's an incredible idea. It's a beautiful idea. However, it is completely in tangible until you and your partner define it, right? Love as a verb is a choice, and it's a choice that you have to make every single day, occasionally every moment of every day, but it's a choice. So if we bring this back to empathy, you know, empathy as a noun is an idea. It's a great idea. It is probably the best idea. However, it's totally intangible and nobody really gets it until you define it. And that's why you know, empathy as a verb is a choice. And it's a choice that you have to make every single day. So how do we choose empathy? How do you choose empathy? Well, you choose empathy by how you define it, right? So, you know, empathy is going to be a little bit different for every single person. I know me, um, a way that people can show me empathy is by just allowing me to speak. A lot of the times, you know, people know what I'm about to say, but it might take me a little bit longer to get a word out. However, I want to say my words on my own terms. And so a way that a person can show me empathy is by allowing me to just talk and not completing my sentences, not completing my words, right? So how do you define empathy? It's a thing that you can sort of think about and then sh 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 share with your team members or your partners or you know just anyone here at the conference. So now I want to talk a little bit about vulnerability and collaboration because I think that you know like those things do go you know hand in hand and uh, I want to do that by <laughs> talking a little bit about me again. So this is me. Um, I have a course on LinkedIn. It's called Communicating with Empathy. Uh, it's about an hour and a half long, and it's free. So you know, like if you guys want to ski it, go online. It's there. It's available. I talk about empathy for an hour and a half. I know. Sounds amazing. <laughs> well, anyway, so. Um, you know, I see this picture and it looks amazing, right? Like there's this, there's, it's so 
professional. It's so well done. However, in order to get you know here, I had to go through one of the most emotionally up and down, terrible, amazing, overwhelming weeks of my life. So when you work with LinkedIn, they fly you out to their um, little studios in this place called Carpinteria, California. It's about 20 minutes away from Santa Barbara. It is a beach town. It is incredible. So you go in, and they created this entire set for me. And then they had like a hair and makeup person. And, and then like after I was done, you know, like I was in like this beach town in, you know, Carpinteria, California. Sorry, this is, wait, there we go. Hold on. Boom, there we go, done. And so, you know, all of these amazing things were going on, and you guys, like, I felt like Beyonce. Like, it was the coolest experience of my life. Whoops. And then, so, you know, all of these really, like, awesome things were happening, and then, you know, like, on the first day, I saw this. Now, this is a teleprompter. So as a person who stutters, I avoid having to read out loud at all costs because it is terrifying, it is demoralizing, and it is really overwhelming. So again, I'm the kind of person who's like, yes, I will absolutely do this thing I've never done before, and then after I signed the contract, and they paid me my like down payment. I then had a panic attack about it. But it wasn't until this very time when I became very much overwhelmed. They were so, so ex excited about the content I had created. I was excited about the content I had created. I had never done anything like this before, and they were like, you're amazing. Like, I know that like, this course is going to help a ton of people. And then I had to read out loud. And the words were coming out so slowly and so painfully. And look, I understand that, you know, like this is a product that they have to put online, that their, you know, n -n 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 name is on. And I was not delivering in a way like, that was going to be okay. And so in the beginning, it was like, this course is amazing, you're amazing, you're a natural in front of the camera, and then it kind of turned into, well, we don't really need any of the scripts, and maybe we should try this, or maybe we should try that. So like their vocabulary changed. They were positive that there was no way this course was going to happen and that I was not going to be able to deliver my content in a way that was up to their standards. And so by the end of the second day, it had gone so terribly and I could not grasp, you know, the teleprompter. I, I, I just could not do it. And so, um, I had actually gone to dinner, and I was in this restaurant, I was by myself, it was a packed restaurant, I'm talking like happy hour packed, and I was on the phone with my husband, and I began to cry, and not like car dealership cry, where like it was a couple of tears, I was bawling, I was crying so hard that the waitress was actively avoiding me. It was embarrassing. I didn't give a shit. I was so, like, I can't believe that they flew me all the way out here. There's just an entire team of people. They spent so much money, and I can't give them the content that they need because of my speech impediment. And so, you know, I was in the restaurant. I cried. I was driving back to the hotel. I cried some more. I got back to the hotel, cried some more. I went to sleep, I woke up, and I cried again because I had to like go back and deal with this again. And then, you know, it dawned on me like, look, 
I'm out here, I need to do everything I can in order to create the product that they need and, and to create the you know, experience that I want. And so that was when I was like, okay, you know, how can I collaborate in a way that's going to be good for them and me? And that's when I asked if I could be alone. Is there any way that I could be in this room all by myself, because then I'll be a little bit more comfortable. And so they hid that. And I was able to sort of create this course that was good for them, and that also made me feel comfortable and proud of the content that we had created together. And so this brings me to the point about collaborating with empathy. So, uh, you know, collaboration, when you put the sort of foundation of it, you know, at empathy, it requires, you know, open lines of communication. So I failed at collaborating with empathy because I wasn't completely honest with them from the beginning. I told them that it was gonna be 100% okay, even though I knew there was no way this was gonna be 100% okay, and we were gonna to have to try a bunch of different things. So look, not everybody is going to be able to work in the same capacity as everybody else, right? All that matters is getting the results that you desire. It doesn't matter how you get there. It doesn't matter you know, how the work gets done, Everybody has to work in their own capacity, and in order to do that, everybody has to feel comfortable communicating the things that they need. I did not do that in the beginning, and that's why I ended up, you know, crying in a restaurant. It also requires a feeling of inclusion and a feeling of safety, right? in order to you know, communicate openly and to be transparent, everybody has to feel that, that they can you know, talk to people and you know, tell them how they're actually feeling and the you know, actual experience that they are having. And the only way that that can happen is if everyone feels safe on your team and everyone feels included. And finally, you know, individuals have to be able to ask for exactly the things that they need. So a lot of teams, you know, it's not okay to say, look, I'm not going to be able to do it how everybody else does it. However, I can get the same things done. I just have to do it on my own terms. You know, collaborating with empathy, it means that, you know, even if every single person has to do, you know, the exact same task a little bit differently, all that matters is that it gets done. Everybody has to ex Except that people are going to be doing things on their own terms. And so I included this picture in here because this was on the last day. Yes, I put hi mom with a heart on the eye. Because this is a picture of a person who, at the beginning of the week, I was trying to do things, you know, the, 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 their way. I thought that there was only, you know, one way to get things done. However, because I was with a team of people who were inclusive, who were trying to create, you know, a safe, you know, comfortable s s space, I was able to ask for exactly the things that I needed, and they gave me that space to, you know, like do things my own way. And that's, you know, why collaborating with empathy is putting people first. If you put the people first, 
then your teams are gonna be able to do way more than you could do if you put anything you know, else other than the people first. So, you know, I talked at the beginning of the talk about choosing, you know, like empathy. And so, how do you choose empathy? So I, you know, call, you know, the, like, these things your sort of key empathy behaviors. And for, you know, every single person, you know, your key empathy behaviors are going to be a little bit different. However, they're probably gonna fall under like three main categories. And those are patience, perspective, and connection. So let's begin with patience. And I'm beginning with patience because this is the foundation of any empathy that you are going to feel and that you are going to, you know, <laughs> try to you know, like actively engage. So like patience means being completely present. We live in a world where we are constantly engaged with everything else other than the people who are right in front of us, right? There's news happening all the time. I know that there's things happening here. There's also things happening in the States. I don't know if you've heard about them. <laughs> and so we're constantly inundated with so many things. But patience is being 100% present. And how do you do that? You have to stop. You have to pause and you have to really just engage in what's happening right in front of you. And then you have to remember the why. You know, a lot of the times we get into these conversations and we forget, you know, why we are having conversations. And then, you know, like things can go like completely off of the rails and you totally forget the why. So always kind of come back to, wait a minute, I'm having this conversation because of X. So remember the why. The next one is perspective, and that's gonna be the root of understanding. So uh, we have to sort of accept that, um, you know, you do not have complete context on what's going on in other people's lives. We think we know everything. However, we don't. And so you have to, you know, just accept that, hey, like this person probably has other things going on outside of, you know, like this, this, you know, specific job. And so, you know, their behavior or their, you know, concerns or their opinions are probably going to be influenced by everything else that's going on in their lives. You also want to think before you speak. What do I mean by that? you need to kind of pause and consider what you are going to say before you actually say it. A lot of people get into trouble because they don't always consider the things they are about to say and they don't consider the person that they are going to say them to and that's when things begin to sort of fall apart. So always think before you speak. And you want to eliminate as much of the bias as you can. A lot of the times when we're talking to people or when people are talking to us, we don't hear what they say. We hear our opinion of what they're saying. And so a thing that I like to do is repeat what the other person has said to me in order to, you know, one, have clarity on a thing that they've said, and then to two, really, you know, embrace their opinion 
and what they said. You want to try to eliminate as much of the biases as you possibly can. And finally, to you know, really choose empathy, you want to connect. And connection is the main reason why we are communicating in the first place. So you want to use empathetic communication. You want to um, speak to people in a way that they can really embrace and understand. You know, everybody is going to be a little bit different, and so how you talk to you know each person is going to change as a result of them just being a little bit different than every other person. And then you want to speak with intention first, and with and, and sorry, and 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 for you know impact second. A lot of the times when we are you know trying to get our point across, we put all of the emphasis on the impact um, our you know comments are going to have, and that's the wrong way to approach this thing. You want to speak with intention because intention is going to get you a lot further along in the conversation. It's going to help you connect a lot better. Impact is going to either cause you problems or you know it's going to um, destroy that connection. And then you have to, you know, approach every single interaction as, you know, it's it's its own sort of situation, right? I like to view every conversation I have with a person as the kind of jumping off point to our next conversation. Um, you know, every time you talk to a person, you are continuing to like build that relationship and to grow that relationship. And so if you treat every conversation as its own entity, you are going to continue to connect and continue to grow very s strong and very, you know, healthy relationships. And so, you know, engaging empathy is, is being incredibly agile communicators. You know, you're gonna be culturally agile. You're gonna approach every single person from, from a place of like, okay, you have a different experience as I do, and so, you know, I want to hear exactly what you have to say because you, you know, have a different experience and, uh, <laughs> and a different, you know, sort of cultural perspective. Engaging empathy is being agile communicators. Every time you talk to a person, you are going to be prepared to have, you know, a little bit of a different conversation than you did with the other person that you were, you know, like just talking to and the person that you are going to talk to after them. And then, you know, engaging empathy is being, you know, an agile thinker and an agile feeler. You know, we live in a world where we go so fast and we're constantly engaged with everything around us all the time. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have our phones, we have emails, we have all of these things we have to keep up with. And that kind of disconnects us from, you know, how we're feeling about things and what we really think about things. And so engaging empathy, it really is going to force you to pause and to think and to feel, and those things are okay. So in order to truly engage empathy, you need to be just agile all around. Thank you.